amazing. I don't understand this. I want, I want those at my house now. But if you do that, you will be definitively a bad guy because bad guys yeah. always love steam. If you go mm-hmm. anywhere where there's steam just roaming around free, it's a bad place because bad guys, they love steam, but they've never learned how to control or harness it. All bad guys <laughs> just have steam just escaping from vents and pouring out of the walls. And it's just they can't they don't know what to do with it, but they just like it. They like the ambience that steam gives you. They're really into tea. They're industrial amounts of tea happening. I don't know. Something. <laughs> God awful movie 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 Welcome back to God awful movies where each week we watch another terrible movie so you don't have to I'm your host Heath Enright and sitting 600 miles to my left is my good friend Eli Bosnick Eli welcome back How you doing brother <laughs> I'm doing a little episode like this. This is my <laughs> choice. You uh bright pink hot dog skin colored right now, just as a little celebration. Feel like that's a sex tape reference. <laughs> that it's both. <laughs> yep. It's all the time. Sex tapes, not sex tapes. That's Hulk Hogan. He's gonna be involved. And let's explain why. Sitting 3,820 miles to my right in the uh, divided kingdom. Is my soon to be ex European friend Michael Marshall. Marsh, uh, before we get into it, what the fuck are you guys doing over there? What kind of ridiculous country elects an arch conservative sociopath who looks like Gary Busey's Muppet? Oh. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we are two days out from the election results, and uh, I, I am not in a good place, by which I mean Britain. I am not in a good place. Uh, right. Now. This is. This is the problem you see with having an annual election is that it doesn't get better. It just means people get so disillusioned with the very concept of politics that they, they just vote, uh, in, in sort of spite and without thinking, I think. And, um, oh God, this, this has not been a good month. This has been a bad, <laughs> bad time. Yeah. It's not been a good few years and it won't be a good. The only saving grace is that the UK technically has uh, something called the Fixed Term Parliament Act, which means we can only have an election every five years. And we've had three in the last four years. Uh, so we know that we've got an election next year anyway. It's it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> All right. All right. So it's been a bad uh, bunch of years for just democracy. It might not be the system. That might not be it. <laughs> Maybe we replace it, it might be with just the smart people are in charge. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> the Greeks did it. It worked yeah. pretty well. well it great for them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> everyone was happy there. <laughs> Let's talk about something amazing with a Hulk Hogan movie instead. So tell us, Marsh, what will we be breaking down today? What will we be breaking down? Well, the uh, welfare state, the National Health Service, the Active <laughs> Union. <laughs> oh, sorry, the film. Right, gotcha. Okay, yeah. Well, we watched Santa with Muscles. Uh, it's the story of a millionaire steroid salesman who bangs his head, gets convinced that he's fictional, and therefore saves an orphanage. This movie makes the argument that the only way you can get the rich to care about starving orphans is if you give them a bout of concussion. And given the UK election results, <laughs> fuck it, I'm willing to give that a go. <laughs> Marsh walking around with a kosh behind people. (laughs) Okay, now do you care? All right. Well, you guys heard it. Santa with Muscles, Hulk Hogan movie. Here we go. And Eli, how bad was this movie? Well, if you love the 2016 Hulk Hogan sex tape, but it didn't fill you with enough shame and existential dread, you (laughs) will love this movie. So I'm going to make a startling argument. If Gawker had used this movie as evidence, it would still exist, right? (laughs) If they had just been like, look, he allowed this to be on tape. There's no way he didn't know that other thing was happening. Uh, They put this up instead. All right, put the sex tape back up. It's cool. cool. I'm a judge. I'm a federal judge. You need to put that sex tape back up. Yeah. Have you guys seen the sex tape? It's impossible to find now. I I have not seen it. Weirdly, I didn't go looking for it. Liar. Okay, Eli, did you see it? (laughs) I have not seen it. I have read the description, however, and it haunts my dreams like Cthulhu. <laughs> that just very much sounds like you're doing that thing where, you know, the book was better than the movie. It's like, yeah, they made a movie version of it, but it's better if you read it. It goes into more details. There's a whole other section. It's, it's great. See, I'm pretty sure that sex tape is the monster from Bird Box, and I'm glad I didn't see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. Maybe the lawsuit was taking that into account. All right. Is there anything you guys would like to nominate this one for being the best at being the worst at? 
Yeah, I, I'm going to say the best worst sound mixing. Now, I know you Ooh. guys have had some horror shows of the stuff that you've reviewed, but this is a, a personal low light for me because there were times that two characters were walking through a room and I couldn't tell they were in the same room. I thought one of them was shouting from a cave <laughs> because I just they were, the sound design was so, so bad. There were other times when they were stood outside and I couldn't hear the dialogue because the background noises of birds tweeting was so much louder than the dialogue. I couldn't hear a word that was going on. So this... <laughs> And what is with the fucking dubbing in this film? It seemed like every other scene was badly dubbed and badly lip synced, like it was a 70s kung fu film. It was, uh, <laughs> there was some strange things going on here. Hulk and his friends doing backyard wrestling just off camera. There was some weird loud stuff <laughs> happening. Yeah, all right. I'm going to go with best worst authorship lawsuit. This is so um, amazing. This is pretty fantastic. Apparently, the original scriptwriter put together a goddamn masterpiece. But then they changed it so much that he filed a lawsuit to get his name removed. He sued them to not use his name as an author. <laughs> and I, I just want to throw this out there. This has happened. The like author writes a script. Hulk Hogan does a bunch of coke on it and then changes all the words for multiple terrible movies that he is in. <laughs> it's like it's this. And there's also the one where he's like a charity worker. I think it happened for Mr. Nanny. Basically, Every time Hulk Hogan's in a movie, he makes it so bad that the author's only choice is to sue them to remove it from his name, to <laughs> strike it from his for legacy. No Holds Barred, which is goddamn amazing. I love that movie. <laughs> so I was going to go with best worst missed chances at one liners. No, <laughs> this so is an bad at it. <laughs> this is an action movie. For sure. kids? Because here's the thing. If it's not an action movie, it's way too violent. Yes. And if it's not a kid's movie, it's way too weird. It's a nightmare. <laughs> so it's an action kids movie. And a staple of both action and kind of kids movies are sort of defeat a bad guy one liners. This movie will miss literally each and every yep. opportunity yep. for those one-liners. <laughs> like yeah, they yeah. thought Arnold Schwarzenegger improvises them on the spot. <laughs> oh, they'll, they'll miss him, but a few times Hulk Hogan will try for him, and I'm pretty sure he's doing improvisation there. He's trying to come up with a few of these one-liners, and they kept a couple. They're so bad. It's the greatest. Yeah, they're amazing. They're so good. <laughs> you get to watch his stupid face think a few times. It's the best. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to take a quick break and then we're going to talk about the plot of this movie, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or, um, or we'll talk about Hulk Hogan's sex tape some more. I don't know. I didn't see it. Maybe you can explain to me what you read about it. You can walk <laughs> us through it verbally. <laughs> or we'll talk about Santa with muscles, whatever. Whatever you guys think is better. We can do one or the other. Santa with muscles. <laughs> Lou, Lou, Lou. Doing Heath stuff. Heath stuff is my favorite stuff. Hey, Heath, will you do me a favor? Oh, my God. Eli, what did you do? Oh, Biff. Yeah, I finally did it. I ripped out all yep. my teeth. No more That's buffing. Right. No more fluffing. From now mm -hmm. on, I'm on EBF. Eli, you, okay, wh why don't you just use Quip? That seems what? What Quip? Oh, it's the best, most convenient way to take care of your teeth. What that mean? That means brushing for two minutes, twice a day, and flossing regularly, no matter what brand you use. Quip makes that simple, starting with an electric toothbrush, refillable floss, and anti-cavity toothpaste. Plus, Quip's electric brush has sensitive sonic vibrations with a built-in timer and 30-second pulses to guide a full and even clean. The Quip floss dispenser comes with pre-marked string to help you use just enough. And of course, Quip delivers fresh brush heads Floss and toothpaste refills to your door every three months with free shipping, so the routine is always right. Join over three million healthy mouths and get Quip today, starting at twenty five dollars. Wow, that does sound pretty good. It, it it does. It sounds better than you're speaking right now. And if you go to quip dot com slash awful right now, you'll get your first refill free. That's your first refill free at getquip dot com slash awful. Spelled G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash A-W-F-U-L. Quip, the good habits company. Now, um, what would you want anyway? Will you chew this carrot for me? Yes, I, I will. Thank you. I'm going to eat some of it. No. Okay. Already ate some. No. 
<laughs> All right, everybody. Welcome to the first ever writer's meeting for Santa with Muscles. Let's do it. Can't wait, brother. I see yeah. time through the bees. Oh, sorry, what? Oh, sorry. No, I gave the game away a bit there. Sorry. Yeah, um, let me explain, brother. Uh, okay. This is Clem. I found him in an asylum last week, and uh, his movie ideas are just the best. Uh, uh, okay, uh, let's let's hear it. I guess. Uh, all right. Two millionaires were friends as kids in an orphanage whose secret underground vault contains exploding jewels. So uh, it's going to stop you right there. It's already nonsense. What? Some of them. Some of them get like so. One of them gets amnesia and, and wakes up thinking he's Santa Claus because the other millionaire's henchman plays an elf at them all. What? Stop interrupting him. It's so so as Santa, he, he goes to save the orphanage against the millionaire's evil team of scientist henchmen, a uh, chemical guy, an archaeologist, a doctor, and electric lady. Did you say an electric lady? Brother, you're being rude. Right, right, no. <sighs> okay, so, so, sorry. So, sorry. No, you said electric lady. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So he, he punches them and the movie ends. Uh, question. Do you guys have any orange juice I can fuck? No. Oh, okay. Well, I'll I'll be having my breakfast on the the moon then. Thank you. Oh, Clem, Clem, don't go to the moon, brother. See, you hurt us, Felix. You hurt us, yeah. Felix. Okay. Yeah, I see that. I mean, we're still going to use the movie. It's 1996. We're using that. Yeah, it's 1996. Nothing good will be made for almost a decade from now. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back, and we're going to start off with a little girl. Doing a VO of her letter to Santa. And it's mostly normal, but she is weirdly knowledgeable about a criminal organization that's <laughs> taking over her town. And she's telling Santa about like the Rico chart she's putting together. It's <laughs> very detailed. Yeah. I feel like we're going to find out that her parent that abandoned her was Elliot Ness. <laughs> <laughs> And the, the weird thing is, we've got all the sort of titles and the music going on, and in the first seconds, you know, the pre-titles, it couldn't say any more to me, horror. You know, the music, the font, it's very kind of uh, sort of Craven-esque. It see, uh, and that is not the beat that this film plays at any other point, other than the first three seconds of the introduction. So it, it really threw me. Yeah, I think they they stumble into horror by accident, but that's not what they're going for now. <laughs> Yeah, we should probably point out that there is, and this is an impressive and wonderful thing about this movie, there is no 60-second period in this movie that bears any resemblance to any other 60-second period in this movie. <laughs> There's no connective tissue between any single minute of time in this movie and any other minute of time. We form a story because we're we're like story forming creatures. But if you told me this was a, just a, a random collection of pictures and sounds that I projected a Hulk Hogan movie onto, <laughs> I believe you. <laughs> right. So we learn right away that apparently some sort of James Spader from the 80s character is trying to take away the orphanage in the town. She lives in this orphanage. We're about to find out. And also everybody's leaving town because the. The bad guy with the, the criminal organization is also taking over all the businesses in town. It's a weird situation. And she's also calling in Santa to like <laughs> to start his shift early and help deal with this. <laughs> she's obnoxious. And that villain's name, by the way, is Ebner Frost. I thought it was Edgar. I have it down as Edgar in my No, it is, it is Ebner, which it's is Ebner. definitively not a name. It's not okay. even close to a name. It's, <laughs> it's a distance away from several different names at once. It's, it's impressive. So I feel like that's someone being like Ebenezer and then Hulk Hogan being like, that's not real. He would probably just be called Ebner and then being like, no, no, Hulk, like Ebenezer is the name of Ebenezer Scrooge. It's a f Ebner. His name's Ebner. All right. You know, I, I did not even make the link to Ebenezer Scrooge, even though this film wants to be like a modern retelling of A Christmas Carol, but a retelling <laughs> by someone who's never read A Christmas Carol or even seen The Muppets Christmas Carol. So they just heard... It's, it's, it's a modern retelling of The Christmas Carol written by someone who overheard someone else explain the plot of Christmas Carol on the bus on the way to the movie studio for the meeting where they were selling a film. And then they've gone, oh, I've got it. This is it. I'll do this uh, a modern version. I think that's what happened here because this bears very little resemblance, but it's sort of in the same, it wants to be in the same place. Yeah. 
as we've got the, the, the little girl's voiceover, as she's talking about this evil plot, we see the evil mansion of the bad guy, and we know it's the evil mansion because steam keeps shooting out of little chimneys all around the, the grounds of the mansion. <laughs> those are amazing. I don't understand this. I want, I want those at my house now. But if you do that, you will be definitively a bad guy because bad guys yeah. always love steam. If you go mm-hmm. anywhere where there's steam just roaming around free, it's a bad place because bad guys, they love steam, but they've never learned how to control or harness it. All bad guys <laughs> just have steam just escaping from vents and pouring out of the walls. And it's just, they can't, they don't know what to do with it, but they just like it. They like the ambiance that steam gives you. They're really into tea. There are industrial amounts of tea happening. I don't know. <laughs> Something. <laughs> yeah. And the producer of this film, we also have to point out, this film is produced by Jordan Belford, a.k.a. the Wolf <laughs> of Wall Street. The it actual is. Wolf of Wall Street. This is such yep. a weird detail. But yeah. when you know that about this film, you it, it explains so much of this film because this must have been a prodigious amount of cocaine behind this film. <laughs> oh, yeah. this film is the penny stocks of movies. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and, and let's be very, very clear. We do not mean that this is produced by the person who produced the movie The no. Wolf of Wall Street. No, no. This is produced by the subject of the film. Mr. Wolf. The Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> also, Mila Kunis is in this movie. It was weird watching the credits. Yes. Yeah. She is. I was wondering how she was going to get in, and she's like creepily young in it, and it, it was a little bit upsetting for me because I... I have a large crush on Mila Kunis. And I was like, oh, she's a child. You're fucking it up. You're fucking it up. <laughs> oh, oh, I got to delete a bunch of notes. Oh, I pre-wrote a bunch of Mila Kunis jokes. Oh, none of them. None of them. Yeah, I'll just turn, turn them into Eli's color in the notes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that works. I do that a lot. Actually, you don't notice usually. Yeah. Weird tie-in, by the way. Don Stark is also in it. He's the guy who plays, we're going to meet uh, an elf character soon named Lenny, I believe, and Don Stark, who is Donna's dad from that 70s show, is also in this, and Mila Kunis is in it. So there's this weird 70s show tie-in. That's amazing, because that means that when they met up for that 70s show, the sitcom, he was like, oh, we met doing, and she probably like held up a knife behind him, and he was like, nothing, we met doing drugs. We met doing heroin somewhere. And she was like, yes, heroin somewhere. Yep. Also, one last tie-in, Jordan Belfort, was in prison and his cellmate was Tommy Chung, who was also in that 70s show. But see? All the it connections all come together. together. I believe there is a God and he's telling us something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the, the board and string grows in Heath's basement. <laughs> <laughs> and we, it, we see something does. here that's only going to make sense towards the end of the... It's I it's never going to make it's sense. Makes no, sense is a stretch. Yep. But we watch them... We watch the villains dragging someone's Christmas tree away. <laughs> yes. So I and we, we what we see is we cut to a commotion and then we see the Christmas tree suddenly be yanked by a, a van with a, a chain. But I want to know, because this little girl's by the window, I want to see what happened just before we cut to that because there's a line of people stood watching that Christmas tree be dragged away who start yelling once it starts moving. So were they just stood there while the bad guy parked up got out of the van, got the chain, <laughs> tied it around the base of their Christmas tree. And they're like, no, I mean, what are you doing? Stop, not- stop. This is a very slow process. Doesn't matter. We're still doing it. I, I want to see where this goes. I want to see where this goes. We don't know where this is going yet. And it's, yeah, it's only when, they, when he gets back in the van and drives away that they're like, no, my tree. Yeah. Amazing. Yep. They're stealing it like it's a giant safe of gold in Fast and Furious. And there's like two of them going by. <laughs> Ridiculous. And who has a, a Christmas tree in the middle of their drive as well? Like That's not where Christmas trees go. Even if you have an outdoors one, you don't put it in the middle of the drive because you need to use the drive. <laughs> yeah. And also, I feel like the middle of the driveway outdoor Christmas tree really only pays off once a year, right? For the rest of the year, you're just like, ah, I can't fucking get around this. Ah, this is the worst. <laughs> well... This is going to pay off later. This technique of taking things, it's all going to make sense. Yeah, it's deeply intimidating. We're, quote unquote, establishing a, quote unquote, pattern in Hulk Hogan's (laughs) mind. And speaking of Hulk Hogan, we now cut to him sneaking around some bushes. (laughs) Yep. Right, and everyone everyone thought that he was prying on the little girl, right? That was your first Absolutely. thought yep. when, when we had 100%. him peeking through the bushes. Yeah. Well, yeah, she's talking about 
like Santa Claus, I really hope you're out there. And it's just smash cut to Hulk Hogan pulling bushes away as if he's looking into the house that she's in. It's very yeah. upsetting. Yeah, he's not, but eh, he's still creepy. And he's wearing <laughs> he's wearing camouflage, but <laughs> his jacket is open and his shirt's <laughs> a very different color. That's not how camouflage works. Anyway, <laughs> honestly, at this point in history, I feel like camouflage is really just there to highlight the douchebags more than it is to like hide soldiers and stuff. So I would argue <laughs> that is how camouflage works. Hulk Hogan's wearing it. He's fucking nailing the point of camouflage at this point in history. <laughs> There's Hulk Hogan. There he is. <laughs> there he is. There's. There's Hulk Hogan or one of his tribe. No, but you can't see him because at this point he's crouching and he walks across the lawn in crouch mode, very, very clearly in crouch mode because he's got a gardener to beat up. So we can't see him. He's stealthing. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And just to be clear, because I had no fucking idea what was happening until my second watch of this movie. (laughs) This is our hero who is a rich guy and I assume every day sneaks into his own house and attacks his staff for practice at go fuck yourself. (laughs) That is what is happening. Is there any more logic we could draw out of this situation or this movie as a whole? Or did I just get what this plot is supposed to be? That's the plot. Yeah. I, 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 all I can think is it's like a reverse Kato situation, you know, Kato from the Pink Panther. Yeah. Uh, where Clusor hires a staff member to surprise attack him at any point. This is a reverse one of those where he hires a loads of people who then he surprise attacks on a regular basis. But that's not oh. a thing. That's just workplace abuse. That's just an abusive <laughs> workplace yeah. that you should report to the head of HR. Okay, when you said Kato, I thought you meant Kalen. And I was like, oh, yeah, OJ sneaking in through the bushes. To Okay, this all, I see where you're going, but you weren't. Okay, your thing was better. Also, yep. you got to wonder what that job interview is like, right? Because they are also like gardeners and chauffeurs and chefs. So there was a weird part of that interview where he was like, yeah, Cordon Bleu School. That sounds great. Um, oh, you worked at a Michelin star rated restaurant. How are you at fighting? Uh, you, no, I did say fighting <laughs> every day. Okay, good. Good. Yeah. There is a very well-trained staff of all those specific mansion-y things like French chef and whatnot. Yeah. There's also, this includes a, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, a karate BDSM chauffeur. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. But the thing is, you know, Eli, you're saying that uh, they interviewed for these various different jobs and had to have the fighting skills. But at no point do we see them carry out the jobs they're dressed as. Even when they get in a car with the chauffeur, Hulk Hogan drives it. So I don't think these are staff. Right. These are these are just people he's paid to dress up in outfits that he then gets to beat up. So this is very okay. heavily into a, a uniform king for him. And I think this will rec- recur throughout the film for me. That, and you know what? That, that makes a lot more sense than that those people who do those jobs, those are he just dresses his friends up as different jobs and attacks them. That makes a lot more sense. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah, movie's yeah. all coming together. Yeah. He attacks them while he's trying to uh, trying to steal back his ornate jewelry box that he just keeps on. He just stores on patio furniture, which is not a good place to store <laughs> that stuff. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, just having a snack on a porch, uh, looking at my uh, Ark of the Covenant that I have that I keep here. <laughs> also having some cheese. Yeah, that's what seems to be happening there. We also get, I believe this is the first Hulk Hogan attempt at a one liner here. Yeah. And it's yeah. pretty fucking great. So he's sneaking through. And he's kind of beating up his own staff. We don't realize that at first, but that's what's happening. And one of his gardeners, I guess, bends down and like checks a, a, a row of plants, a row of flowers. And Hulk Hogan sneaks up behind him and like gives him a big suplex or whatever. Then he says, never stop to smell the roses. <laughs> because, yes. Yeah. You know, the rose is the flower. There's it connects garden. So there's, yeah. there's two problems for, for, for me about this. One is that there isn't a phrase, never stop to smell the roses. The <laughs> phrase is very much always stop to smell it's the roses. do that. Right. It's You're do that. To so do that. But the other thing is, and this isn't for nothing, those aren't roses. They're not even, you could have, movie, you could have got roses <laughs> and at least it would have made sense. These are just other flowers. Oh, it would have been amazing if the guard kept smelling very clearly other flowers and just Hulk Hogan waiting, being like, that's all right. I'm, I haven't, I'm trying <laughs> oh. to do a thing. Go to the roses. And he goes, almost does it. Pump fakes, goes to the, <laughs> the petunias. <laughs> All right, never like, stop and smell the lilies of the valley. Come on. That <laughs> was on purpose. You know I was waiting for the roses thing. Being a dick. 
Right. And this is where we are introduced. That's a great point because this is where we're introduced to Blake's rules. So <sighs> apparently this multi-millionaire karate person it also has, he sells protein powder and is constantly dictating out loud truisms to his staff, which they write down and memorize. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so isn't, uh, I forget which one he says uh, at this point. And he says, oh, and what rule are we up to now? And the butler says, rule 385. And he says, okay, make it 386. It's like, no, because then there'd be a gap. <laughs> Let's keep it in 385. <laughs> Learn to count ordinarily, Jesus. <laughs> That's maybe how he's got to 385 already, because he just puts random gaps in the middle of them. Yeah, so <laughs> he he quizzes his staff on his rules for a little bit, and then he's off to do the only activity douchier than dressing up in camo and attacking your staff, paintball. Paintball. Yes. Yeah, it might yeah. as well be zipline paintball just to trigger you. <laughs> just just before he does that, one of the rules he gets his staff to recite is uh, never give an inch, especially when you can take one. And I thought, yeah, I always figured Hulk Hogan was a bottom. Yeah, absolutely. He's all about taking <laughs> an inch, I think, Hulk Hogan. <laughs> and if you had read the description of this, you, watch tape, that you wouldn't know. That. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Marsh, you would know. He's supposed to be a skeptic. Anyway, so... Read a gawker. <laughs> <laughs> so we watch him... Cheat at paintball, but not really, because all that happens is he shows up and someone's like, all right, we're almost ready to play paintball. And then he point blank shoots that gentleman in the chest with a paintball gun and drives away. <laughs> yeah. Such a dick. Which is not paintball. He's the guy who stands next to the spawn point in a video game of paintball. Like that's <laughs> that kid. He's just standing in a delivery room. Someday your kid might play paintball. Pat. Pat. <laughs> <laughs> but he's out. So he he races off having achieved his paintball assassination. And this is where we're going to cut to, I will say, one of the really great comedy performances of the movie, <laughs> Silly Cop. Yeah, yeah. This is Clint Howard. This is uh, Ron Howard's brother, <laughs> yep. by the way. No, that's so <laughs> painful. Those, those had very divergent careers. No, that's so sad. I did not realize that that was Ron Howard's brother. I was like, oh, I know this character actor. He's actually good in some stuff. But the fact that he's Ron Howard's brother casts a dark shadow over this <laughs> performance. He had a rough little stretch. He was on Seinfeld for a little art for an episode for a second. He was like a murderer. And then he was in a Hulk Hogan movie. As a very small side character cop. It's rough. Yeah. It was a bad time in the 90s. Anyways, he's playing laser battle with his speed gun. But then Hulk Hogan drives by going super fast. And it's time for a, for a high speed wacky chase. Yeah. <laughs> I, here, here's why I'm hesitating to say this. The, the music in the background might as well be yakety sax, but he is running from the police. Mm. <laughs> In, in effectively a straight line as well. It's not an interesting <laughs> chase, particularly. And at, at one point, the guy in the car with him, who isn't his chauffeur, but is driving, says, you know, maybe we should pull over. And uh, Hogan says, rule number 20, never surrender. And that seems really weird that that was such an early rule. Because earlier he had like, never mix big business with pleasure. And that was rule 385. How come that took until nearly 400 to get to, but never surrender came in at number 20? <laughs> <laughs> what was his life like early on in the rules? <laughs> Yeah, suicide by cop happens a lot or attempted in Hulk, Hulk, Hulk Hogan's life. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I think it might because we do see on the cans that he's in, intent on making his tan even darker. And I think that's the reason that the, the cops pull a gun on him because of how tanned he is. They mistake him. They don't realize that he's right. And that's why they suddenly pull a gun on him in this, uh, in this car chase. That is very plausible. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I assumed he was just going for Tanner and Tanner because eventually he wouldn't get in trouble for saying the N-word on his sex tape. <laughs> and he was like, what kind of tan do I need, brother? <laughs> so yeah, he's he's running from the cops and we cut over to the mall where Business McBusiness Lady, who will never matter again or be a character, wants to know where that darn Santa is. And Lenny, who at this point I believe is a... Henchman for Ebner Frost? Question mark. I is he? I think he's a generic like 
mobster mafia, like law level mafia type, because all of his mates seem like they're in the same kind of mafiosa place, but we never see them again, so we don't really care. But he just owes some money to Ebner Frost. I don't know how he ended up owing money to Ebner Frost. He owes him $50, which doesn't seem like a lot for Ebner Frost to be getting worried about. And so he owes him money, but I don't think he's working for him. But they do not make this clear. They don't put no. any effort into this connection at all. Well, I think the the mall Santa mall elf Union is controlled by the Cosa Nostra. That's what that's what oh, seems to be happening. Oh, okay, gotcha. that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that would also sense. explain why they have a little house in the middle of the mall that they appear to live in, right? Like, because there's like, uh, there's no reason for the Santa's house at the mall to have a kitchen and a no. kitchen table, which a series of Italian Americans dressed as elves are sitting around playing cards at. But he's trying to negotiate with the business McBusiness lady. Instead of Santa, he has a, uh, he uses a slur, but he has a little person in a clown suit, which is his opening offer versus yeah. Santa. What was he told to do? If, 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 <laughs> like, if somebody's like, okay, where's Santa? Did you find him? And you say, no, but I have a little person in a clown suit. You got weird instructions. <laughs> <laughs> you got very weird. In, or you have a very weird interpretation of those instructions. Or you're bad at listening. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was very open to that being like his thing throughout the movie. Like every test they were like, Hey, we're going to go get lunch. Do you want something? He's like, I got a little person in a clown suit. <laughs> like if he's a one, every tool fits the hammer kind of guy, that would have made sense. Or if he had just brought Oh him God. Yeah. And then right near the end of the film, it pays off in some w weird way. It's like, wow, we've got this vent and what we need is someone to be able to fit through the vent, but then blend in on the other side, which happens to be an evil circus. If only we had a little <laughs> person in the clown suit, we'd be able to save the day. And this guy steps up. <laughs> The hero we, we need. That makes a lot of sense. And pulls out a gun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know just the thing. All right. So he owes money to Ebner. And Ebner's assistant, Dr. Blight, is an evil doctor. And, and, and we're going to cut over to Ebner's, as Marsh pointed out, steam-filled lair, where he is <laughs> torturing a gentleman... With mm. his team of reject scientists. The, <laughs> this is the best part of the movie. This is my favorite This bit. choice for these three scientists is the best thing in the movie by far. <laughs> Into selling his shoe store. So those scientists are <clears throat> the geologist, Dr. Flint. <laughs> yes. Yep. The, the chemist, Dr. Bile. And yep. Dr. Watt, who has electric... Gloves. Ions. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh God. The, these are, uh, superb. So what I, what I love about, they introduce each of these, uh, evil scientists one by one. And so we go geologist first, which, yeah, it's not the most intimidating of all sciences. I, <laughs> you I don't really want to open to with a geologist. Them, you know, geologically. But this geologist, he looks like Jacob Rees Mogg, but specifically Jacob Rees Mogg does. cosplaying as his movie hero, which is one of the Nazi archaeologists from Indiana Jones film. I see. That is <laughs> yeah. what he looks like. <laughs> and, That's and very he, accurate. <laughs> he comes up to this guy who's, who's being tortured. And you'd think, you know, we've got three scientists torturing a guy. So obviously in your head, you're picturing various different types of scientific torture. Nope, they're just hanging you upside down from a medieval torture device. So what a waste of an evil scientist. He's got an evil PhD just sat there waiting to be used. But no, we've gone for uh, for a medieval technique. But the, the geologist comes up, brushes his face lightly with a little brush and says, you'll make an interesting fossil. And he says that because this movie doesn't know about paleontologists. Mm -mm, <laughs> it doesn't no. know that geologists don't do fossils. That's someone else. No, they do not know that word. We all knew that this was that would be paleontology and not geology. <laughs> <laughs> also, the chemist specifically, when they introduce him, they say we have Dr. Bile, the Canadian chemist. Don't know why they say Canadian there, but we do. It was, <laughs> it was a weird piece of shade. Very weird piece of shade. He has expertise in mildly unpleasant smells. That's, yep. that's what he uses. Yes. He will provide fart gas and nothing else. And that's it. Throughout this film. Yeah. Yeah. And then Dr. Watt, they don't even bother pretending she has science. They're just like, and then there's Dr. Watt who has electric gloves. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> she can make roses explode. Electricity <laughs> makes roses explode like their kryptonite, she, like their dynamite. Yeah. Yeah. She 
didn't stop and smell the rose. She just explodes it. <laughs> yep. And it's also the thing I like about these three characters. I think, I think I've got a theory about this. I think the movie had a different wardrobe designer for each actor and those wardrobe designers were not allowed to confer. And so they all <laughs> just turned up on the day and, w- and went with what they'd come up with. And they were also not allowed to read the script. They were only allowed to know the the name of the character they were dealing with. So we cut over to Hulk Hogan sneaking around the mall. Well, he's sneaking out, he's sneaking around the mall because he's escaping from the police, and he does that by like jumping out of the the moving vehicle. But before it, he says, uh, "Rule twenty one: When in doubt, get out." Which is not a rule that Hulk Hogan heeded during the filming of this film. Because had he paid attention to those rules, <laughs> he just dive rolls and walks out of the movie. Yeah, yeah, that's I, what I was going to say. Yeah. I haven't seen the sex tape to see whether he he pays attention to the rule when in doubt, get out in that case. So maybe we need to check that out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah, he's hiding around the mall. And what does he see? Because of course, everyone's like, hey, have you seen Hulk Hogan? <laughs> <laughs> when he sees a Santa suit. Yep. So first he like, diverts the security guards and he's like is that Roy Moore and they all run away and then he gets with the Santa suit <laughs> and uh, the walks back out wearing something different than what he walked in with which was weird Yep. yes yeah he walks out wearing a new set of boots which were not in the outfit he picked up so <laughs> yeah, I don't know right. where he got those boots <laughs> and this this is not the first or sorry this is not the last time he will accessorize this outfit in ways that are not explained at all no he just has access to accessories at any even point yeah spoiler alert he will later be outfitted by a child in a way so bizarre I worry for the actress Mila Kunis let alone the character <laughs> but we'll get to that so yeah he he's Santa and he fools the guards for a second but then a kid walks up and says hi Santa and he's like fuck you which raises the guards suspicion because yeah. the, this, the, the thing that we see them thinking or I think that we're supposed to see them thinking is that's weird the real Santa would never be that mean to children. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So does does this film believe that Santa is real or not? Because that seems to... I get lost in that. Film. Yeah. I think the film loses out w- whether it believes in Santa or not throughout great, this film. Great question. I'm going to say the production crew and the people in the universe of the movie are both in a pretty big argument about it. And about 90% <laughs> of the adults, yes, Santa's real, but 10% are holding strong. No. And they're going to be in a fight about it in both universes throughout. (laughs) Yeah. So he attempts to hide from them in a garbage shoot. Well, just before that, so they realize that one of the other ways that they realize he isn't the real Santa is as he's walking away, he's got his combat fatigues sort of tucked in his back pocket, which I think is handkerchief code for uniform stuff. (laughs) (laughs) It's enhanced interrogation play. I see. You have the, uh, <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Wonderful. Camo hanky. You be the waterboarder. I'll be the <laughs> Mexican guy you think is Muslim. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be Hulk Hogan. Yeah. So, so he decides to hide from them in a garbage chute and surprise, surprise, that doesn't work out. So he falls down the garbage chute. And I guess instead of dying, he gets hit on the head and has amnesia because it's a movie and that's how you get amnesia in movies. And also that's what amnesia is. It is a two bonk system by which you forget only your name and who you are upon the second bonk. You remember everything and your brain is no worse for wear. I, so yeah. I think that it's, it, this is a very specific form of amnesia because it is triggered by garbage. Proximity to garbage is what turns his amnesia on and later <laughs> off again. So it's that's a very true. specific form of amnesia. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think they did that on purpose? I don't think so. <laughs> I think that's amazing writing that you've just found, Marsh. You just yeah. got in there, surgically removed the one piece of good writing in this film. Yep. <laughs> little, little person clown suit, garbage enhanced amnesia. We're writing a better movie already. Yeah. <laughs> but they didn't, they don't use this enough. Like they, once later in the movie, the like rebumping your head thing will change the amnesia again. It'll like bring back stuff or whatever. But I wanted to see them like, keep having his head get bumped and him change characters because now he changes into Santa Claus. That's what happens here, right? He bumps his head and he believes he's Santa. Well, he gets found by Lenny the Elf and Lenny the Elf wants to rob him so he says he's Santa Claus. That's why he thinks he's Santa. Oh, I thought thought he thinks it and Lenny like confirms it or, or it's just purely Lenny tricks him. 
Lenny tricks him, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think Lenny Lenny tricks him because Lenny need, Lenny was told by the business lady, who, by the way, I, I did look up the business lady. She quit acting after this film, which is a lovely little detail. <laughs> she, she saw this film come out and went, no, no, this is not for me, no. it turns out. I'm going elsewhere. <laughs> but she told him you need to find Santa. And so obviously Lenny does the obvious thing of going to stand by the garbage chute and wait for a Santa to fall out. And I, I hope he had to wait there as like three Easter bunnies and a tooth fairy came out first. And he's like, no, come on, move along, move along. We, we've got to get to a Santa here. Yeah, so he tells him that he's Santa and they they go to greet the children. And look, we I could spend hours on what Lenny's thinking process is at any <laughs> given moment of this movie, but the movie certainly doesn't. So yeah, he goes into the middle of the mall where children are chanting and screaming for Santa like he's an 80s hair metal band. <laughs> I thought they were going to sacrifice him and blood was going to pour out of the screen and I would know the TV was off and I was just on acid. <laughs> why, why does anyone bring their kids to this ritual in real life? It's a fucking nightmare. You're, like, it's a weird, usually drunk, weird dude who decided to dress up as a Santa Claus for a <laughs> temp job for a few weeks in a mall. <laughs> what the fuck are you doing? So, Keith, Marsh, you are aware of this because, oh, Marsh, you aren't. But, Heath, you're aware of this because you've seen the pictures in my home. My wife and I, we go see Santa every year. And so we now have a Santa collage of <laughs> Santa's being amused that an older young person is there to see Santa transitioning into seriously, why are you here? You look like you're in your late thirties to Santa doesn't feel safe. I remember him from last year. That's great. It's a little flip book. If you use your imagination unrelated, are you going to, are you going to bring your child to this ritual in the future? Absolutely. To meet what? Santa. Are you oh, serious? God, no. Eli, do, but never let them sit on Santa's knee. Never let them meet Santa. Just make Please. your child take photos of you and Anna. Absolutely. That's Santa's exactly knee. what I was going to say. I was going to do. I'm going to be like, listen, kid, daddy's got to go meet Santa. I'm going to sit on Santa's lap, tell him what I want for Christmas. And then if my kid asks any questions, I'm going to be like, oh, because Santa's not fucking real, idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I just like upsetting strangers. And someday, so will you. <laughs> <laughs> Eli's kid, Baron Bosnick. That's his name. <laughs> and and so we get a little montage here of oh. children asking Santa for stuff. And we have um the only one I want to point out is two children decide to fight to the death in a kumite <laughs> on top of Santa. What was that moment? <laughs> My my favorite bit was the first kid to sit on his knee because as soon as he sits down, this kid immediately turns quickly around and looks at Hulk Hogan with pure abject horror and shock, <laughs> which made me worry that Hulk Hogan was just rock hard during the filming at this particular point, and this um, kid is just horrified by uh, by the experience around him. Very possible. Also, Hulk Hogan freaks out right away, and I'm pretty sure the face we saw from Hulk Hogan. The person in real life was like, this is a black kid. What the fuck do I do? That's what happened, right? <laughs> he does seem truly horrified to be in the same space as an African-American child. It is very strange. So, yeah, he we have a Santa montage and then two hooligans try to steal the orphan fund nearby. So it's time for Santa to fist fight them to the joy and merriment of the children around. And I just want to say, if you love mall Santa's getting into fistfights, you will love upstate New York. Come on up to me and Heath's hometown <laughs> where you can watch a Santa get in a fistfight with the stranger at a mall every day of the year. I've watched Santa Claus in a fistfight way more times than is reasonable in my so life. Many times. <laughs> a lot. So, so many times. Also, just one little note I have on this fight. At one point, so he's beating up the hooligans. At one point, one of them grabs like a plastic candy cane and they dubbed into this movie someone going, watch out, he's got a candy cane. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, if you've never seen a Santa get thrown out of a bar by a bouncer as you're walking by like a projectile out the door of a bar, you're missing out. It is fantastic. 
<laughs> rolls onto the sidewalk, throws up a little bit, full Santa outfit. It was one of my favorite moments of my life. <laughs> Santa's entire fighting strategy, not just in this fight, but also I think throughout the entire film, is to stand still and wait for the attacking person to miss him and then punch him once. And that is his entire fighting strategy, which seems to be bulletproof throughout this entire film. Uh, and the <laughs> yeah. other thing I absolutely love is all of the people are just cheering Santa on, but there's way more people around mid-fight than they were at the start of the fight. So did they all see the people try to steal money? Because otherwise, they're just cheering Santa beating two guys up in a mall, which is a very <laughs> different feel. <laughs> Again, I'm. this movie is taking place in California, although if it were taking place in parts of Florida, that would make sense. Or again, me and Heath's hometown. There are ways that this makes sense. So yeah. <laughs> so Santa decides he's going to save the children's mission and rides off into the sunset on a scooter with Lenny on his back. There's, there's an important point with, uh, with Lenny just before this as well, because we need to understand Lenny's motivations for, throughout this film, because while all this is kind of going on, Lenny's lifted Hulk Hogan's wallet we see him lift his wallet, look at his uh, driver's license to see who he is and recognize that he's rich. At this point, we see Hulk Hogan's uh, driver's license photo, uh, which he is so tanned, it basically <laughs> constitutes a hate crime. It's, it's, for a second, <laughs> I initially thought he had Justin Trudeau's driver's license. That's how badly tanned <laughs> Hulk Hogan is at this. But Lenny then takes this to an ATM because he recognizes that Hulk Hogan's character is like a millionaire. And he's like, I'm rich, I'm rich, I'm going to sort of rob him. But he can't get money out of the ATM because he's using one of those speak your bank details allowed ATM machines that were all the rage in the 90s. But of course, those 90s machines, you obviously needed a, a thumbprint to get in. We all remember this from the 90s. So this is why he's not able to, to rob. Santa I was going to ask you guys, I think I'm older than you. So maybe I would I would be the one who knows. But I don't remember uh, uh, neither speaking nor um, biometric analysis <laughs> of your thumb being part of an ATM machine in the 90s. <laughs> no, and there's a, there's a uh, I would say a security risk with this particular ATM machine or the system that it's based on. Because the machine says, hi there, Mr. Blake, if you want some of your money, please uh, put your thumb on the scanner. It's like, well, aren't you better off doing that after you've identified him from the thumbprint? Seems like you're going <laughs> because, yeah, in order. And yeah. reading it aloud is, is not a good solution to these problems either. <laughs> I mean, I, I like the accessibility of it. You know, the ATM machines, they're much harder to, to operate these days. You've got hearing impairments. Back in the 90s, they just shouted at your bank details out for everyone to hear. But at least right. people who had hearing impairments could use them. So it was, it was, you know, it was equal access at that point. See, I think we need to bring the talking ATM back, right? You're just at a bodega somewhere in upper Manhattan. Would you like to pay a $15 fee to this mob-owned thing that just stole your credit card number? <laughs> also, Lenny, yeah, like you said, he lifts the card from Hulk Hogan, who is a rich person in real life. So he's hoping to steal a bunch of money at the ATM. And the ATM asks him for his thumbprint. And Lenny just... <laughs> tries his thumbprint like it might work. <laughs> Why would you think that that would maybe work? You miss a hundred percent of the shots that you don't take. Here we go. All right. And so there's there's a there's a point where Lenny then gets on the the, the scooter and and they move on to the next scene. But just at the very end of the scene, there was a really lovely little moment where as the scooter moves off in the distance and there's a crowd of people cheering Santa on, two elderly women come really close to the screen to mime a conversation three centimeters away from the camera. Uh, and they're, because they're so close to the camera, their faces have to be so close to one another that they're basically touching. And after a while of them speaking, I stopped seeing their faces. All I could see was a vase. I couldn't see their faces anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, excellent illusion. So now we cut over to Ebner Frost, and he has succeeded in torturing that shoe store salesman into selling his thing. So all he has left is the orphanage. Yeah, R really quick. What the fuck is he wearing? Is so he's got the. I have no idea which character you're talking about. It could be literally okay, any. Yeah, no, uh, I allow me to clarify. Very good point. <laughs> so we're looking at Doctor Ebner Frost, the evil scientist, and his like lab assistant guy. Uh, I don't know what that guy's name is. Doctor Blight. Doctor Blight. Doctor Blight. Okay, thank you. So Doctor Blight, the assistant, has a lab coat. That's kind of what you would think would happen. Uh, Ebner Frost is wearing a. A wizard robe for a stripper. That's all I yep. like. That's what it is. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. He's a Dungeons and Dragons themed burlesque dancer. That it's is like the a only burlesque thing. smoking jacket. It's very confusing. Yeah. <laughs> Unclear. Yeah. But it, he's basically saying we're going to get those orphans. So it's time for Dr. Blight 
to head over to the orphanage to try and work his charms. Now, <laughs> I should point out, this is a children's movie, so they don't do like a Dr. Blight trying to fuck the pretty lady who runs the orphanage scene, but that's definitely what they're inferring from this scene, right? He comes up to the mm-hmm. door, she answers, and he's like, I just wanted to know if I can offer you any help, <laughs> if you know what I mean. What is this interaction supposed to be? Because they're supposed to be intimidating the orphans out of the orphanage. And Dr. Blight seems to think that he can seduce the lady who's in charge of it to get the... I I was very confused. What is this scene supposed to be? I I don't think they've thought through this plan very well. Because their two strategies seem to be have Dr. Dr. Blight fuck the lady who runs it. The end. Uh, And the other strategy is turn up with a van and remove bits of the orphanage piece by piece and I take it take a statue away is that, is that their plan is like well if I can't convince you to sell it I'll just steal a little bit of it each time with my van until there's nothing left yeah. also I want to talk about the sign there are things that I wonder about at night when I'm alone and everyone's asleep and I'm alone with my thoughts what happens when we die what's the point of life and why do they continually pound signs that count down the days till Christmas on this orphanage's lawn throughout the movie <laughs> I I believe that is uh, somebody was like, hey, you know what good writers do? Ticking clocks. And they decided <laughs> to do ticking lawn signs. So yeah. they count down dates. Ticking, I, I have ticking no idea. shopping days until Christmas signs. Yeah. Just to be clear, as they are in the midst of intimidating this orphanage, they come over. Just for those who didn't watch the movie, and you should 100% watch this movie. They also pound in a sort of political front yard sign that says three days till Christmas. Three, three shopping days until Christmas. Yeah, three shopping days till Christmas, <laughs> yes. Yeah. So they, Or maybe they're just, it's just pro-capitalism. They just want to throw that <laughs> message in there. I don't know. So they, they do that sign, and then the, there's an African-American gentleman who also works it there, and he runs out to stop the van from getting away with their statue, and they plan to run him down and murder him? Yes. Okay. That is their evil genius plan. You've got three scientists, very highly qualified minds, and their best plan is to run the guy over. Which, for me, when they when he's saved and they don't run him over, I thought, well, there's the stakes of this film gone because just call the police and say they tried to kill me. And I've got lots of witnesses to that. <laughs> the the end. We don't need this uh, this Santa guy turning up and doing anything to help us. We, we've got this guy now. It's all sorted. Yeah, but no, the, instead of doing that, they're, they're sort of right about to run him over, and then Hulk Hogan is holding the the truck back with, with the, the chain. With the chain that was dragging their statue that is uh, crucial to their orphanage business. <laughs> and uh, that's no longer being stolen, so they're saved. Yeah. His powers have now wildly differentiated for this scene. He has now gone to being able to stop a speeding truck instantly with his super strength as opposed to before which was just sort of like general kick punchery yes it's he he (laughs) seems to fluctuate wildly throughout this film uh, as do the people around him as well because at one point lenny couldn't drag him and then later in the same scene lenny just picks him up puts him over his shoulders not a problem so this film doesn't understand it it, it, it's like it hasn't got object permanence for people it doesn't quite know what people can do at any given point (laughs) Or a bunch of other nouns. It has yeah. very little permanence for anything. Yeah. Yeah. But anyways, he's stopped a staff member from being murdered. So, of course, he's invited to dinner. So he goes inside to have dinner. And if it isn't the little girl who was writing Santa the letter at the beginning of the movie. Oh, there's a lovely exchange between him and this girl. Because the girl says to him, I bet you had a long trip, Santa. And he says, thank you. So, yes! what? <laughs> Oh, it's amazing. Also, Clayton turns out to be the African-American gentleman's name. And he has an incredibly dark moment here. He goes, man, if I was a younger man, I wouldn't have stood in front of that truck. Is that what he says? (laughs) I don't know. Yeah. (laughs) It's a a dark moment. (laughs) Like, if I was 20 years younger, I wouldn't have tried to get killed by that truck. I I don't know what he was saying. That is the only interpretation of that (laughs) sentence, right? Is that if I was younger, I wouldn't have tried to die just now. But don't worry, you stopped me. (laughs) We also meet young Mila Kunis here. She's one of the orphans in the orphanage. 
Yeah. I love the living room of this uh, orphanage. The theme of the decor is uh, opening titles are saved by the bell, <laughs> which is a nice theme. That is a nice theme. Yeah. <laughs> love that show. Are you a saved fan, Marsh? You watch a lot of saved? I, 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 I enjoyed a bit of it when I, was, uh, when I was younger. We don't get a lot of it these days, but yeah, it was, uh, nice. it was solid. Rock out to Zack Attack. <laughs> There's a British yeah, version do. called Crunk yeah, by the Tallywag do. that Marsh liked a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> It only lasted two seasons, and at the end, everyone was dead. But, it, you know, it's British TV, so you get it. You get it. <laughs> so, yeah, they montage through the dinner to, to Lenny the Elf, like, in the middle of telling a body story. Like, that's when the next scene is going to take place. Lenny the Elf is literally like, so I'm fucking her, right? And the kids are like, oh, <laughs> Lenny the Elf. That's the tone of it. It's so weird. Right? It's absolutely like a, and so she says, don't come on my back. And I said, <laughs> too late. And the kids are like, oh, Lenny, <laughs> you scam. Kids are pouring himself more whiskey, laughing. Yeah. The, the weird thing is the stories he's telling are stories of Santa's exploits because he's talking about the North Pole and getting around the North Pole. So has the movie forgotten that he's just making these up and he knows it isn't Santa? Like, what is going on at this point? Uh, and there's a lovely line from Hulk Hogan as well where he says, um, I'm really glad to be here. I'm not really sure why. And I thought, yeah, I'm the same whenever I come on this show. It's exactly the same. <laughs> I feel you, man. <laughs> yeah. So, so this is when the kids ask if it's okay for the two full-grown men who they don't know the names of but are both dressed as Christmas characters can stay the night in this building. And the answer is yes, because they've known them for almost an hour. So yeah, <laughs> totally fine to just put them alone in a building full of children. And there's a moment as well where Elizabeth, the young girl, gives Santa a kiss on the cheek and uh, Hulk Hogan reacts with the kind of shock delight that only reinforces my Hulk Hogan's character is a millionaire who gets erect around kids theory. That's <laughs> the only thing. I just wanted to be like... Elizabeth, have I ever told you my rule about always giving an inch? Follow, follow me. Like, if, honestly, if this behavior got any more blatant, I'd expect Lawrence Krauss to come on screen to explain that Hulk Hogan never fucked a child in his presence. And as a scientist, he's got to follow the evidence and conclude that he's innocent. <laughs> Look, I just uh, rode on Hulk uh, Hogan's airplane and I, I had too much honor. I had too much honor to break up my friendship with Hulk Hogan. <laughs> yeah, so we conclude the scene on a rather dark note. They're like, oh, why are there so many empty rooms here? And she says, well, you know, we found homes for all of the kids except for the better kids. Yeah. Uh, good we ones. rehomed all the kids that we could. Three kids sat around the table listening to that. Amazing line. Absolutely perfect. <laughs> God, it's like getting drafted for kickball in gym class. Just like, you three suck. Like a, with the puppies lining up at the the puppy store and those three. It's sad. It's real sad. <laughs> right. So it's bedtime and it's time for some pajama based humor. Lenny is dressed like a, a bunny and Hulk Hogan is dressed like one of the wise men. So I guess we're supposed to think that the only clothing they had for adults in this orphanage were costumes from the Christmas like yeah. play. But, <laughs> but but Why that doesn't they have make an any more exactly. That doesn't make any more sense. <laughs> no, not, it doesn't. The only doesn't thing that makes sense. Anything. I, I think the only thing that makes sense is that Leslie, who runs it, and Clayton, the guy who runs it with her, are just into some really niche costume stuff. They're into shepherd play. It's it's pretty niche, but mm. uh, they get pretty hot with it. Okay. Or <laughs> one of the kids that already got adopted was fucking enormous and still got picked <laughs> ahead of these three kids, even though he was a six eight two fifty type of. Child orphan. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so the next morning, it's time for Lenny to go and try to steal his money again while Santa tries on the new Santa suit that Mila Kunis's child character apparently stayed up all night <laughs> making for him. And it's a, it's this SM tights wearing fuck vest. <laughs> Yeah. Describe this with costume. leather gloves, with very, very clear leather black gloves, and he he didn't have those gloves <laughs> to begin with. They found those gloves around that orphanage. By the way, <laughs> she also says she learned to sew from a yes. Mega Man comic book. <laughs> I, I wrote in my notes: she learned to sew from a Mega Man comic book because I died, and this movie is the last firing of my brain cells before I enter the darkness. <laughs> yeah, this also means she's the ten-year-old uh, dedicated employed seamstress at this orphanage which is <laughs> so strange it is so not bizarre appropriate 
But uh, just as he's trying out, and again, I can't describe how inappropriate this. It's a sleeveless Santa vest over incredibly tight leggings. We will spend the rest of the movie staring at Hogan's package. But um, <laughs> it's the news at the door, and they want to do a big story on Santa beating up someone at the mall. Yeah. And then, and they heard that Santa was living at the orphanage. And I thought, how how did you hear that? He got there <laughs> last night and he's been asleep. And Mila Kunis couldn't have found the, the, the news because she was up all night at the sewing machine. So she's been busy in the, working in the sweatshop. How did the news get uh, get wind of this? Clayton. Must have been Clayton. Where we've yeah. limited down our suspects. There's only they one person. got a mole on the inside. A little <laughs> kid? I don't know. <laughs> Tinker so Santa I, soldier I spot. actually had a theory on this as well. Because because <laughs> I've seen, uh, because we've seen Hulk Hogan acting a bit dodgily around kids, my theory is Santa, Hulk Hogan, is a pedophile. The orphanage is an illegal sweatshop. And Ebna Frost is actually the good guy shedding a light on this whole thing. He's shutting that orphanage down because of the sweatshop. Ooh. Thank you. Thank you. I agree with the things Ebner Frost is doing several times throughout this movie, and that <laughs> makes me feel better about it. I think that's oh, what's happening. There's an after credit scene where we see Ebner just like crawling over to a computer and registering gawker.com with domain stuff. <laughs> <laughs> domain name. All right. So now we watch him blow the interview, and he blows it in, in some pretty horrifying ways. Like, it's supposed to be comedy, but they're like, hey, Santa, how come you're so buff? And Lenny's trying to, like, sign language all the stuff to him. and But he keeps getting it horrifically wrong. Like, how come you're so buff? I killed and ate my reindeer. Nope, not <laughs> not what he was signaling. What? I also love the uh, the first uh, question from the, the journalist as well. She says, uh, Santa, can we have a word, please? Without pausing at all, she breaks straight into, how did you get here? Which is a really weird question to ask because, like, that's that's not the bit anyone was wondering about about this story. So, like, did you did you take the bypass or did you did you come through town? Because there's road work on the on the main street, so do you you had to go around. I'm guessing, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Traffic is terrible. <laughs> and then he ends this little interview by basically saying, "If you're naughty, I will come to your house and kill you." <laughs> I mean, right? that's a little extreme, but most kids are shitty. I like a Santa Claus who's willing to admit that, you know? <laughs> so he ends his interview on that little threat, and we, we cut over to Mr. Frost again, and he and his henchmen are planning to th steal the orphanage more extra <laughs> double. <laughs> and he's mad. Frost is mad because... Now everybody knows Santa lives at the orphanage and that fucks up his plan. I, I, don't, I don't understand anything about his plan. It doesn't even make sense after the end of the movie. We'll get there. Uh, what, what's, what's happening right now in the yes, movie? Do you guys nothing, know? nothing in this movie will ever be related to anything else or make any sense. However, we do get Lenny trying to steal. He, he stole Santa's milk at breakfast. So now he's going to use the glass to be the thumbprint. But it's the wrong thumb. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so he has, yeah, he has Hulk Hogan's right thumbprint from a glass of milk that Hulk Hogan had during breakfast. And then he brought that with him to this ATM and he's rolling the outside of that glass over the thumb sensor. Yes. Um, The print would be backwards at that point. <laughs> yes. But, but the ATM machine... And the people who wrote this movie are fucking stupid and don't understand geometry. And the ATM says, sorry, that's your right thumb. We need your left thumb. Yeah. But that's not how it would work. The, sen the sensor would think that was a left thumbprint. And yeah. the reason it wouldn't work is because thumbprints aren't identical reflections in the y-axis from our right thumb <laughs> to our left thumb. Uh, and also, I mean, the, the good thing about this thumb scanner, like all good fingerprint scanners, it recognizes all of your fingers and then tells you which specific one it needs. So it, it says, like, oh, yeah, I'm just, uh, you know, we, we, it, when you set this up the first time, it's saying, well, we need you to scan your left thumb because that's the one you're going to use to access your bank account. Right. right okay. Now we need you to scan your right thumb so that we can recognize like, when you definitely 100% definitely you turn up uh, to get your money. <laughs> but you put the wrong thumb on the pad. 
So we need to tell definitely you, because it's definitely you, because you've got your right thumb there. We need to tell you that to use the other thumb. Uh, <laughs> so now, uh, now we just need to, uh, there might be a time you mistakenly try to log in using your dick, so we better scan that too, just to be on the safe side. So tell I, you do, to do, I that. do dick log, log in a lot. Okay, that's good, just in case. Yeah. yeah. Also, by the way, assuming the bank has uh, your left and right thumbprint like you're describing, the sensor would then, that means it would think that you ripped the skin off your right thumb and then sewed it back on, but accidentally onto your left thumb by accident. <laughs> That's what would be happening there. The ATM should be asking different questions. That's all I'm saying. It should ask you, you know, what the fuck's happening in your life that you're ripping skin off your thumb and sewing it back on the other side. Are you Nicolas Cage and are you doing a face-off? You have to tell me it's like a cop. So what is now we're going to cut over to a scene... Off. that <laughs> will live in my heart and imagination forever. Literal letter writing girl is sitting in the church of this orphanage because this orphanage has a full scale church in it <laughs> singing angel baby to herself. Yes. What is, uh, what is this song? Yeah. Do you know this song? The, okay. I was great question. I was going to ask the same thing because they describe it as like, oh yeah, everybody knows this song. Like Hulk Hogan's like, I don't remember that song. And it's fucking terrifying. <laughs> it sounds like a little girl helping Hannibal Lecter cook a live angel baby. That's like what the lyrics are giving to me. She's singing along to this song. And then they do like a weird sing-along thing. I, all my notes say is, hey, if you were worried this movie doesn't have a clumsy sing-along with Hulk Hogan dressed as an s and Santa, do not be. <laughs> yeah, and, and just to be clear, when we say angel baby, you might think this is kind of like a Christian, they're in a church, it's Christmas, maybe they're talking about Jesus. That is not the direction of this song, because the lyrics are, you're so fine, angel baby, mind for all time, angel baby, you're so fine, angel baby. This is somebody talking about their lover, and Hulk Hogan sings this with a seven-year-old girl <laughs> in a church. <laughs> it's the best. He doesn't know the lyrics, though, in his no. dumb script. No. So he tries to sing along, but he has to do that like fake song lyric thing where you pretend you know what's happening. And it's the greatest. I would watch hours so of long. Hulk Hogan trying to fake song you lyrics. You get to. You watch so such a long time of him being like, Angel ba baby, baby, love, hurry down. The nope, that's nope, the wrong one. Nobody's singing now. You went past. It's just it's just a, a break. Just whatever you do, don't don't cut this shot. <laughs> All I can think is that this is the only song this child was willing to sing and they all just had to go with it. Like, this is take 40. <laughs> they've got a real song. She refuses to sing that. She's singing a song she's just made up and they all just have to go with it for the good of the film. Understandable. Wow. There was one interesting philosophical question brought up here in this scene, though. Does Santa have a mommy and a daddy? Or is Ooh. he like atemporal, like a god? What do you guys think? <laughs> These are great questions, but ones that we will leave unanswered. So we cut well, back. I, I want that story of like the parents whose kid decided to become Santa Claus, a thing that didn't exist yet. Like, mm. it's like, <laughs> it's like the story of parents who pay for college and their kid goes into podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> we, when you think about it, we are like Santa. That's We're what I've like always Santa. said. I've said that our job is a lot like Santa. Right. So we cut You're back welcome. to the, we Everybody. cut back to the uh, orphanage where the bad guys have thrown the statue that they stole earlier's head through the window as a threat like a kkk style threat yeah it's very weird i thought they were gonna walk outside there'd be like a reindeer on a flaming cross or something it's crazy <laughs> what these, these bad guys have decided to do they've also that means like they cut the head off of a metal statue Yes. So it was like hours of them outside of this orphanage with like an industrial metal saw and like acetylene torch. I don't know what you would use to do that. Is this the statue that they stole? Yes. Is it the statue they stole away and they brought the head back? Yes. This doesn't seem like the most intimidating thing they could be doing. But they didn't steal it because Hulk took it off the chains and then stopped their truck. That's right. I'm saying this plot doesn't add up. I'm saying there's a little bit of there's a few <laughs> moments. This is one of them. Santa with muscles is not checking out. <laughs> so here's the thing. Again, this is a trope in movies, right? They throw a thing through the window and drive away. Except the bad guys here 
don't drive away. They're just waiting outside and they have a fist fight and lose and then drive away. Yeah. They, they also have a sign that says one shopping day left until Christmas, which confused the hell out of me because yesterday there was three shopping days. What happened to that? How long was he in the church at this point? We just <laughs> This movie does not know time at all. Based on how long it felt, I believe that he was there stumbling his way through Santa Baby for 24 straight hours. <laughs> so it checks out for me. <laughs> He fights this evil doctor as well. And I think this is a waste of this guy's evil medical degree. Because if you're an evil doctor, don't fist fight a wrestler. You know, be more efficient. Harold Shipman killed a lot of people in the UK as an evil doctor because he was way more efficient. He had better time management. He knew where to apply his evil skills. Just be better, (laughs) evil doctor. Talk to Andrew Wakefield first. Yeah. (laughs) Right. So he wins the fight. And then there's this weird lingering cut on one of the orphan's faces as he stares into the middle distance like he's remembering Vietnam. Now, that doesn't make sense until a scene later when he has disappeared and we learn that he has disappeared because he has gone to Mr. Frost's house for vengeance? Yeah, it's not really clear. And if you're wondering (laughs) where you've seen this boy before, uh, it's in Mad Magazine. He's uh, You've seen this kid in Mad Magazine. (laughs) Yeah. Also picket fences. Yeah. <laughs> He's been all sorts and of places. He disappears from this scene despite being stood amongst them all within like 10 seconds. Like he's there. They turn away. And then a second later, he and the statue head have gone and no one's heard him leave. And all, my only theory is that the statue head is the ring from Lord of the Rings. And he just sort of picked it up and just went invisible. And now he's uh, now he's gone. See, that, that may, I noticed that the statue head was missing as well. And I wrote, oh, Taylor wandered off to fuck the statue head. Because that's where I would go. I'm just saying, I get it. I think uh, I'm going to go with Marshes. I'm going with Marshes. <laughs> okay, fair, fair. One vote. Well, we'll see what Noah says <laughs> next week. We'll, we'll bring him in on this conversation. Morgan, if you'd like to chime in. Anyway, so they it's head a over metal to... Head. Go... No, it's, it doesn't matter. I don't even want to just... You'll, you'll find out. It's called Vaseline Heath. Look it up. Anyways, <laughs> they head over to Mr. Frost's house. <laughs> so they make their way through to the millionaire's house where they find Taylor What came there to assassinate Mr. Frost with a slingshot? Yes. Yes. That's the plot of right. the movie. And, and we have this weird thing that he sets up. He's like, hey, we never do violence. And Taylor rightly is like, literally your character is defined by violence. And he's like, no, I was acting in self-defense, which <laughs> just for the record, no, he wasn't. He went <laughs> outside and fought someone. That is not self-defense. <laughs> Again, me and Heath's hometown, we've seen lots of people say that as they are led into cop cars. We know what self-defense means. Yeah. Hulk Hogan believes in the stand your ground version of self-defense. Yeah. Or stand <laughs> other people's ground in this case. Yeah. Um, so there's only one moment in this scene that I actually enjoyed, but I enjoyed it a lot. The bad guys are just like walking around the outside of the property of their evil lair here. And they're just trying, they're trying to say math words because they're scientists. Oh my God, this is so good. And one guy, they like, all they could get was like a half a sentence twice at different times. He says, well, we could just square the denominator. These, you, yeah. I mean, you can do whatever you want to any part of a fraction, <laughs> I guess. You could square a denominator. You could fuck with the numerator too. You can do whatever you want, but those are nonsense words. And then also, Uh, A little bit later, because they couldn't combine two sentences about science or math, he says, if you quantify that data, and then he, and I was like, finish your thought. What you could, it becomes data. What do you even mean? They have no idea. They just tried so hard to have science and math words. I I got the rest of the sentence. Uh, So the first guy says, yeah, the first guy says, if you quantify that data, he's interrupted by the second guy who says, it'll never work. And then the first guy (laughs) finishes his sentence by saying, you'll see that I found the formula for pain. So these are evil scientists (laughs) who are trying to figure out the formula for pain. Wait, so if you don't quantify the data, though, he wouldn't have found the formula for pain? Well, I think that's obvious, yeah. Just if you, qualified if you cube the data. denominator, you get something else. Oh, you don't you, get yeah, pain. You, you, can't you get mild it. irritation. Oh, fuck up your whole thing. <laughs> Jesus Christ. You've also got Ebna Frost uh, briefing the doctor on how to clear the orphanage. And I thought, I'm not really clear why he's asking his personal physician to do that. Ebna Frost clearly misunderstands roles and responsibilities. You know, I, just give this guy an org chart and we'll be, we'll be way, way better <laughs> off. <laughs> and the formula for pain, that's fantastic. <laughs> 
All right. Well, um, I believe we have an amnesiac Santa Claus and some orphans pitted against a mad scientist with a fart chemist, an electricity haver, and an archaeological, a paleontological torture expert. That's the plot of the movie that we're watching for our job. So we're going to take a quick break to think about our life choices. <laughs> uh, also, you just heard the Act 3 hard sell. That's about as hard as it gets. So stay tuned, and we'll be back for the Hulkomaniacal conclusion of Santa with Muscles. No, 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 this doesn't want to have one either. Hey, hey, Eli, what's up? What are you doing? Oh, hey, Heath, I'm just trying to find a new murder mystery podcast to listen to, but they're all lame and they don't even have, you know, what I'm looking for. Mm, right, right. Have you tried Detective Trap, though? What's Detective Trap? Oh, it's a brand new podcast from Wondery and the Los Angeles Times. Detective Trap takes you into the life of a cop who conducts herself relentlessly. Hosted by award-winning journalist Chris Gofford, Detective Trap is the story of a detective who fights through her own personal struggles and society's indifference to bring a serial killer to justice. And Trap's strongest resource for catching dangerous criminals? Personal experience. Ooh, that does sound good. But, you know, does it have a good story? Like, it has a great story, and it's incredibly well done. Really good podcast. All right, I'm in. Oh, wait, wait. Is it, you know, free? It sure is free. You can subscribe to Detective Trap on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you're listening right now to podcasts. You can also find the link in the episode notes. Check it out. Thanks for the recommendation, Heath. I will check it out. All right, great. Um, Just out of curiosity, what murder podcasts were you trying before uh mostly guided meditations but like nobody um, ever got murdered so yeah well that's true they they do not in those ever <laughs> <laughs> all right everyone welcome to ebna frost's super evil team first up let me introduce you to your bosses this is dr watt i think you'll find her shocking oh very scary <laughs> electricity classic Classic. Next up is Dr. Vile. His ways with chemicals are fairly explosive. Oh, um, yeah. Oh, okay, I guess. Yeah. A little bit weaker. A little weak. And then, of course, there's Dr. Flint. He's quite a hard man. Sorry, uh, really quick. Just a question. Yeah, uh, you in the back. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, is that guy, uh, sounds like you're describing him as an evil archaeologist? Yeah, he's an evil archaeologist, Dr. Flint. So what? Like, he, um, like, gently brushes away dirt, but evilly. Very, very evilly, yeah. Okay. Uh, I, mean, I'm, I mean, I guess. Okay, but then, of course, no team would be complete without my right-hand man, Dr. Blight. Sorry. Really, again, uh, can we save questions until No, the... I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but, like, Dr. Blight, is he... Is he just a doctor? He is my personal physician, yes. Okay. He doesn't have, like, germ warfare or anything like that? Oh, no. Absolutely not. No, I, I am a germaphobe. That's why he's here. Oh. So, he's here because you're afraid of germs? That's... Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, I mean, that feels a bit less evil and more, I don't know... Health and safety? Health and safety, exactly. That's all I can uh, get from that. Do you guys want to be on my evil millionaire team of henchmen or not? Uh, I guess so. Sure, sure, yes. Okay, good. Here are your doctor's coats. Uh, okay, you know what? Never mind. Great. No, thank you. Thank you. Ooh, mine's got a stethoscope. Let's play nunchuck <laughs> bite. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back. When we left off, Hulk Hogan, <laughs> the wrestler, was trying to figure out a two-dimensional representation of geography. He was having trouble with it. He was looking in the window of the lair, and he saw a map, and he was very confused. And after a few hours of staring at that map screen and then looking up the word excavation that he heard the bad guys say, he's back at the orphanage now. He thinks he understands what's happening. So he's having everyone help him make a list of 
stuff that's underground because there's something maybe under the orphanage that the bad guy wants. <laughs> and, and this is the craziest conversation. The adults go, oh, what's underneath the orphanage? There's water and power lines. And then the kids go, oh, and of course there are those old catacombs with the safe door <laughs> to which the adults <laughs> reply, not I didn't know about those. The adults reply, oh, yeah, of course, the catacombs, which means that the adults did not think to themselves, oh, what's underneath this orphanage that could be plot relevant? Maybe it's the water and the power lines. <laughs> oh, catacombs. Sorry. You know, yeah, I mean, I didn't think that was what you meant by, uh, uh, you know, didn't seem relevant. No, nope, that's 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 what I was going for. Something exactly like that. Yeah. So they go down to the uh, catacombs that they, they have. And at this point, I, it, it clicked to me as to why the evil guy had an evil archaeologist on staff, because he's got to excavate some catacombs. This, he's, he's very good. I mean, he's done some forward <laughs> planning there. I take it back. <laughs> See, this plot makes perfect sense. <laughs> right. So we learn that the kids, this is so insane. The kids have figured out that the combination so far is 8, 24, 16. I would give my left testicle, the one that makes boys, to find out <laughs> how they know those three numbers are correct without the rest of the combination. The lock tells you when you get a correct number, Eli. It makes a little bling when you hit the right one. Everybody knows that. There's an even stupider thing as well because they put the numbers in and they go, so it's eight to the right and then it's uh, 24 to the left and then it's a further 16 to the left and what you've done there... <laughs> Is 40 to the left. <laughs> you have to alternate directions on a console lock. You just did 840. Also, it wouldn't be 16 after 8 going in that direction. You'd be counting up if you were dialing in that direction. They're so dumb. It's pretty crazy. So yeah, they, for some reason, and this will be explained, heavy air quotes, but Hulk, Hulk knows the rest of the combination. So he opens the vault, and inside are set pieces from Avatar. <laughs> okay. It's, uh, it's an exploding crystals cave, apparently. They are, yeah. quar according to the movie, they are quartz filled with electricity. <laughs> <laughs> yep. They're glowing red rocks, which I, I don't think they make Hulk Lee lose his strength, but they do turn him into an arsehole, I think is what the red rocks do. <laughs> See, I just wrote in my notes, rocks that give off their own light and heat kill you. 100% of the time, they kill you. I learned something from Chernobyl. And one of the kids picks it up, and the Leslie, the one who runs the orphanage, says, oh, put that down, you don't know where it's been. It's like, that isn't the risk. The risk isn't that no. it's dirty, it's that it's warm and glowing. That quartz has electrons, put it down. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, so then he has this weird moment with Lenny that, that will never affect the plot where they're sort of standing outside the vault. Everyone else heads upstairs and he's like, you know what, Lenny? I'm starting to think I might not be fucking Santa Claus for the first time. <laughs> to which Lenny doesn't break and go, yeah, you're not Santa Claus. You're this millionaire. He goes, well, you know, you were wearing fatigues when I found you. So you're probably a murderer. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll let you, uh, you know, have a nice little think in this uh, explosive cave. I'll be upstairs. All right. Bye. <laughs> yep. So now we cut back to the orphanage. We, we have a, a moment where Lenny gets a phone call from the evil Ebner and he says, you better help me get in there. So the, the lights go out and they go to check who it is. And it's uh, it's the doctor again. And he has a T-square. He has a T-square? He has a T-square. And the thing is, when the electric went off, I assumed the bad guy they'd sent to, to turn the electric off was the electric lady, but no, didn't even didn't even use her <laughs> no. for that. The lights are just off. That 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 evil Doctor Blight is there. The kidnapping that they, that he uh, you know he kidnaps them all at this point. The stakes of this kidnapping are pretty low. It's possibly the lowest stake kidnapping I've ever witnessed. He's also holding the T square to someone's throat as though it is sharp. <laughs> yeah. They don't know what a T-square... I think they think a T-square... Like, everybody who made this movie is quite certain a T-square is a hammer. It's a weapon. Oh, I figured it out. They think the T-square is what you use to square the denominator in the formula for pain. <laughs> oh! <laughs> thus the formula for pain. Also, we have a great moment of one-liner here. The entire movie grinds to the halt so that Dr. Blight can say, you know... 
I have a Christmas wish, Santa. Get out of my life. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's the one liner. Yes. So they fight again and Santa wins. And it's a long fight, but we're not going to describe it because it's so boring. But they fight again and Santa wins. But just as he's about to deliver the killing blow, I guess, an animatronic Santa knocks Hulk Hogan off the building. He lands in a garbage truck and his memory is back. Yeah, and this this animatronic <laughs> Santa, it's weird because it suddenly t- comes into life and it creepily turns around and puts his hand around Hulk Hogan's waist like it's David Silverman at an atheist convention. It's very strange. <laughs> I, I, I literally wrote, Santa just got hired by the American atheists or whatever. The International. The atheists yeah. alive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're very excited for what Santa's going to bring to this industry. <laughs> yeah. By the way, just really quick, I got to talk about Hulk Hogan's just physical motions throughout this movie. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, it's a terrible, terrible movie. Don't watch it. But watching him watch try to do things physically is amazing. He's He runs several times, and it's it's pretty fantastic. We, in fact, he's like near the top of our list. Like We need to hire all the different stars from terrible, terrible god-awful movies to have like a track meet or something. Oh, just a race. I just yes. want to watch David A.R. White and Gary Busey and Hulk Hogan try to run against each other. And We uh, have that budget. I have $6 in my wallet right now. We've got it. John we Ratzenberger. Yeah, yeah, we got to get him. <laughs> um, but yeah. Hulk, Hulk Hogan's fighting style in this movie is also rough. He's a professional, you know, wrestle actor. But... It's it's the 90s by now, and his his fighting style was already a little too passive in the 80s because he was kind of out of shape by then. So it's rough. Like, his big move now is just getting hit. You know, like, he can't do any. <laughs> it's like, you hit me, and I, like, get mad, and I'm still going to be able to fight back a little bit, but not very well. Yeah. His signature move was a leg drop, even in the 80s. That's just falling. His signature move was just <laughs> sitting. Yeah, it's I'm doing a, gravity. I'm gonna jump and land and hope not to kill you. And my legs will be under me because I'm a professional. What? Of course. <laughs> what how else that's just falling. You just fell. A lot of people's legs end up on their shoulders. Anyways, so yeah, he wakes up in his mansion and his butler ex- explains to him that a garbage man recognized him, knew where he lived, and brought him back home with no further questions. Yes, he recognized him from one of his products, which which does he put his home address on the packaging of all of his products, <laughs> which seems like a risk. Although, to be fair, it 100 percent paid off this time. So I can't knock it. You know, it's a bit like how I've got my personal phone number on the Merseyside Skeptic Society website, although without the paying off ever. part. <laughs> also, Marsh, do you want to think again about telling me that I can access your personal phone number? <laughs> Because you've just made a terrible mistake. I just don't know if you want that in your life, but I am going well, to now. It's there. Enjoy. It, you All really right. can't do anything and about it now, a, can you? So it's, it's about to be on skepticoftheyear.com as there well. So we're <laughs> all going to find out together. Got a lot of fun planned for QED next year. So yeah. Also, the butler he, says happy Christmas here, which was just weird to me and to Hulk Hogan. You could see him like in real life, the actor, Terry Hulk Hogan Balea, whatever his name is, being like, Fuck you, happy Christmas, <laughs> Jew. Yeah, definitely got cut. Yeah, so he calls the orphanage because he's woken up and he knows who he is now, but she's mad at him and never wants to see him again. Or does she? Uh, I have no idea what was happening in the scene. They do a, a fake phone call of her. Yeah. They record yeah. her saying the exact right things that they then play back to him because they've tapped his phone. Do I have that so right? It's, yeah, it's the conversation she had with Dr. Blight when he was trying to seduce her right at the back of the start of the film, which you'd think would pay off in the sense that he's been, Dr. Blight's been having a dictaphone all the time, although I rewound back and he very clearly turns the dictaphone off and puts it away in his pocket. So they did not record this conversation. The movie didn't bother okay. going back and checking that. <laughs> also, uh, it's good that Hulk had perfect timing on this call so that they could play back Exactly <laughs> with that timing, this piece together recording they made, I don't understand. Yeah, this is Dark Knight levels of villain planning ahead. I'm going <laughs> to pretend to be assassinating the mayor so that they arrest me and I'll put a bomb in it. They Look, the Joker and Dr. Blight were obviously comparing plans before their movies <laughs> in their 
levels. All right. So the kids are all disappointed and they're sitting there all sad. But then Miss Electro blows the door open. Oh, no. The bad guys are here to take them down to the vault to claim the electricity filled quartz once and for all. <laughs> that is the stakes of the movie now. They have yeah. shifted. Yeah. And you think, well, all right, they've got the orphanage. All these people, the kids are going to leave now, but at least, you know, they're going to be safe. But no, he wants to keep the kids because he said, if I don't have you, who's going to do the mining for me? It's like, well, if you can pay to, if you can afford to pay doctors, geologists, chemists, and evil electric ladies to arrange your basic land acquisitions, you can probably afford a few hired hands to do the mining. Just think about your resource <laughs> allocation here. Yeah. And, and look, I get it that it's supposed to be like the, ooh, mean old man is going to make you do that but like on a practical level children would not be good miners <laughs> like this is not <laughs> it's not going to be useful and it's like ah oh, they keep falling asleep at 8 p.m we got to get some you know we should have hired a miner guy in, in in retrospect the electric lady she really hasn't served much of a purpose <laughs> <laughs> she opened that door she exploded the wood with electricity she did That's she opened true. the door for the fart attack this is a fart attack by the way this is another they're they're using the chemist guy and Ebner Frost has a hazmat suit on to avoid the the fart gas, I guess. And also because he's a germaphobe, I thought it was a combo of the two. I don't uh, know. It's confusing. Okay. I'm just saying if only one guy has a hazmat suit and you're not that guy, you're in on a bad <laughs> plan. Like, that's a bad guy. Even if you're part of the bad guy gang, something's going to go wrong for you. <laughs> yeah. So... We cut back to Hulk and he's sadly eating his oatmeal because the orphanage doesn't want to have anything to do with him anymore. And his <laughs> servants are trying to cheer him up by playing surprise attack. It's like, huh? Huh? You want to yeah, play surprise the, attack? There's a great oh, line from fun. one of the servants who says, uh, I've never seen the boss like this. He usually loves to hit me, which I wrote, uh, that's Eli two months after Noah's quit smoking. That's going to be what you'll do. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't think Noah's going to hit less because of the smoke quitting. I'm just going to throw that out there. <laughs> but that's when Lenny call Lenny has had a change of heart. He calls Hulk Hogan and says, you have to save us. The bad guys are here. And then, of course, Dr. Blight picks up the phone and he's like, I'm going to beat the crap out of you, Dr. Blight. And Dr. Blight's response is just like, no, thank you. <laughs> the line that Hulk Hogan says to Dr. Blight is, uh, remind me to introduce you to my two little friends, lefty <laughs> yeah. and righty. And I'm just going right. to point out, he isn't talking about his fists there. Hulk Hogan has <laughs> named his balls lefty and righty. And I'm, I'm not sure if lefty is like my left or your left, but uh, we'll have to figure that out. <laughs> Very clearly, Dr. Blight's like, so, sorry, was that sexual? You, the two little friends? <laughs> And then he warns the Hulk to stay away from, you know, trying to win the end of the movie. He's like, look, you know, stay away from the orphanage or I'll use your little friends in my experiment. And then Hulk is like, okay, you said little friends again. Are we still talking about <laughs> now it's the kid? This is an upsetting <laughs> of your metaphors. <laughs> You're going to use my anyways. I'll, I'll see you when I fight you. Okay. Yeah. I'll see you when I fight you. So, <laughs> and then this is, this is another, another one of my favorite moments in this terrible movie. Hulk. Uh, is mad here, so he crushes the cell phone that he was using, but yeah. not really. It do it does not go well. He tries to crush it in his hand to be like all Hulkster ish, but <laughs> almost nothing happens, and he's just like, "Fuck!" I really just broke one little piece there. I thought that would be oh, impactful. This is, this is a yeah. lot sturdier than a shirt. Can I say that, <laughs> brother? I'd like to think he was then thinking, I mean, I'm, in a way, I'm glad I didn't break it because this is clearly the only cell phone that Lenny knows the number to and I, it might be useful for me to communicate with the people I'm trying to rescue. So <sighs> breaking this was probably a bad idea, actually. I've got a very, I got a soft bruise on my hand. It's squee, you know, <laughs> it didn't break the skin, but it's like it made it like a weird angle. <laughs> it's going it's to yeah. leave that. It's going to look like weird for a while. Also, it's 1996, Ow. which means this thing costs at least $750. I really <laughs> fucked this up. Yeah, that's what cell phones cost now, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but they weren't just phones. So so now we head back over to the house. They're almost through the safe door because Mr. Frost doesn't know the thing. And it's time for Hulk to run from the cops again. And nothing you ever do will convince me that this wasn't just <laughs> leftover footage from the first police chase. That they were like, ah, oh, I'll use it in the second half of the movie. <laughs> And the thing is, he's, he's using his staff to, to, to go and rescue the kids. And I just thought, what was this day like for his staff? 
You know, he so their boss gets found in a bin dressed as Santa, wakes mm-hmm. up sad, and then says, "Come with me to beat up some strangers." And they're like, "Yeah, this seems like a good way for me to spend my Christmas day. I'll, I'll do that with you." <laughs> Two Christmases in a row, you're a dick. Same thing. <laughs> you have a weird <laughs> life, and you're a dick. This bonus this year must better be huge, <laughs> right? And so, so we have some distracting the cops moments here. They put the the oily salad dressing on the ground, and it makes their cars slide, and then. <laughs> then he just throws protein powder at them for some reason. Yeah. Uh, none of this makes any sense. What you don't know about that protein powder is intensely carcinogenic. That's, uh, that's the stuff <laughs> I couldn't sell. <laughs> Turns into the smoke demon from Lost and just it <laughs> surrounds them and like the car explodes for no reason. The police spin yeah. out. The <laughs> one bottle of salad dressing, it's like infinite Hanukkah oil and it turns into like the oil slick from Spy Hunter and everything goes crazy. Cars exploding left and right. Every one of those salad dressing bottles contain 50 gallons of oil, which is, that's the best thing about them, but it's also the worst thing because the cost per bottle is necessarily prohibitively expensive. So (laughs) that's the other reason he couldn't sell. Not a great seller. (laughs) Also, there's this moment, Clint Howard's character has this crazy line. He's the only one who makes it through the protein powder and he goes, I was in Desert Storm, you know? Which is... (laughs) Yeah. What a weird choice for that character. Weird flex. Okay. Let's make him a veteran. <laughs> Drive a Dodge Stratus, motherfuckers. Desert Storm. How dare you? <laughs> yep. And then, of course, the last thing he dodges is a rocket launcher. The police have a rocket. A rocket launcher, which they shoot at his car in, in an attempt to kill him and everyone aboard. But he dodges and it hits the other cop car with Clint Howard in it instead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And what Clint Howard should have done was uh, find an occupied civilian vehicle that they could use as a shield while having this kind of shootout with that whole cop. <laughs> so now we cut back over to the orphanage where it's time to finally break the orphans out once and for all in a combination of just punching people and... I'm going to say Home Alone tactics. <laughs> yes. Home Alone, but like improvised on the spot by somebody with Hulk Hogan's brain. Like, <laughs> yes, that's what's happened here. He's just like looking at objects and being like, no, wacky shenanigans with, give me a second, a uh, car battery, <laughs> just stuff he can think of. That's what the first thing they do is they break. Well, they don't break in. They electrocute the, the sentry at the front door with the old car battery shocking through the doorknob trick. Yeah. And it's not just looking at objects. It's also looking at the people around him because he looks at a chef and goes, oh, the best way to distract this henchman so they come and get electrocuted is for the chef to show him an entire platter of food that he just, he must have on him. He's a chef. He's got that food (laughs) on him anyway. So this is going to be the best because I can't think of any other, any other way we could distract this henchman into looking through the, the spy hole of the door other than an entire platter of appetizers. A platter of finger foods. Okay. (laughs) Um, uh, philosophical question again. What does this movie think electricity is, in your opinion? <laughs> Ooh, that's great. It's I. I I'm going to go with somewhere between dynamite and water. <laughs> okay. <Yes. laughs> uh, uh, hey, you know, follow up question, Eli. What do you think electricity is? Just like, how would you describe it? You know what? I'm going to be fair. Somewhere between dynamite, dynamite and water. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know the yeah. writer of this movie who sued to have his name taken off the uh, the credits? Eli Bosnick. That's, That's right. That's a big twist at the end of this podcast. Just because I don't use a pseudonym on this podcast doesn't mean I didn't use one in another life. <laughs> so yeah, they're bonking and fighting their way through the thing and they they make it. There's also another fantastic missed one-liner moment here. They They spray one of the henchmen with a fire extinguisher and there's this pause, right? Because it's the it's the Dr. Bile, the stinky guy, right? And they spray him with the fire extinguisher and they all pause for the one-liner and the kid just goes, <laughs> see ya, wouldn't want to be ya. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't want to s- spray, it, pa- fire, give me a second. S- smell fire. you later. Shit, too late. Wouldn't, ah, I should have said smell you later. Stick with the first thing I said, but keep this. Yeah. <laughs> Also, he's spraying a guy who's wearing... Th- this guy also, some, at some point, put on a hazmat suit, Dr. Blight or whatever. It's one of the few times when a fire extinguisher would literally do nothing if the target is wearing a full hazmat suit. Yeah, unclear. Also, they wrap him in tape, which makes his fart smell go into his own suit, but then they throw him 
out a window. Again, these are all physical bits of sort of action movie, but they're not connected to any other physical bits, right? It's like if yeah. you cut all of the Jackie Chan comedy bits, but then you like threw them in a blender and then put them back together again. And you were like, <laughs> yeah, it's because his magic tuxedo legs make him rumble in the Bronx. Got it. It's a movie. <laughs> 1996. Also, you don't have to tape somebody into an airtight already hazmat <laughs> suit. That's nothing. You're just put decorating it with tape now. Indeed. Indeed. You are. So then he fights an insulting Asian stereotype. Uh, yes, somehow this guy is both tanned, but he's very clearly trying to be Asian as well. And he's somehow both simultaneously in yellow face and brown face, which is impressive that he's managed to achieve both with one face. Gross. And the, the noises are troubling. Mm. To quote Marcia's notes, if I may, oh, the noises. Oh, oh, no. No, thank no, you. Thank you. <laughs> There's a lot of there's a lot of wah! swipe left on these noises. A lot you. of white guys going wah in the, this part of the movie. Quit Bumble too because right. of these noises. So now it's time to face off with Electric Lady, and she's like, "You wouldn't hit a woman, would you?" To which the movie responds, "But I would." And then Lenny dumps a bucket of water on her. Yeah, yes, yeah. I'd hit a woman, he says, before not doing that. So you didn't need to admit to that, Lenny. You could have just poured water on her and we wouldn't <laughs> think you beat up women. Yeah. I, I wrote in my notes, I'll hit a woman, a heroic moment by the hero in this movie. The hero. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the good guy. Fuck. But I really thought they would do something a, a little bit more creative with killing the electricity lady. Like... Like, you know, connect her to a dead car battery so she, like, <laughs> jump starts it and she dies. Or, I don't know. You get a long argument about them. Like, no, you put the negative to the positive, the positive to the ground. What is it? it we have to plug it into a part of her with no paint. <laughs> yeah. So now they burst into the room where the adults are being held. But they're not being held. Just to be clear, they're just sitting in there sort of waiting for the movie to end. I don't think they know that doors have two functions in the movie. <laughs> uh, close and open are the two functions. The movie's not aware of that. <laughs> and just to be clear, this moment happens mid-climax. This is very important. Mid-climax, he, he blasts in the door. He's like, you're free now. And they're like, yeah, there were no guards and nothing has kept us here. We were seriously just waiting the movie out. And Clayton is like, wait, sit down. I would yeah. like to give you... The insane backstory of this movie. <laughs> oh, this makes no sense at all. And I sort of called this from when he did manage to figure out the combination on the door and his, his initials were carved in the door, which we saw at the time. And he was a BT. I wonder what that could mean. Anyway, I, Blake Thorne, are going to carry on through this film. But now we get the backstory and, oh God, it's worse than I thought. Yes. Yeah. So, so weird. he was an orphan at that orphanage. Yeah. And so was Mr. Frost. But he just forgot about the cave full of electric quartz? Yes. Because uh, he's yeah. supposed to have his memory back. Yeah, he's meant to have his memory back at this point, but he didn't remember that he had a best friend called Ebner Frost, which, to be fair, that's such a common name, there's no way he could have known it was the same Ebner Frost. Well, <laughs> I'm guessing he was having a lot of garbage-based concussions as a child. That's what happens <laughs> at, a, at an orphanage where they, they make you do weird amounts of manual labor, I guess. I don't know. And there's just one tiny moment as he's doing this, he gestures to a photo and I wanted so badly for them to pan over to like a super roided out muscly baby. And he's just like, oh, there you were. <laughs> Little Blake Torchesky. With the handlebars, the mustache. And everything. <laughs> so now it's time for the final confrontation with Ebner. Well, Dr. Blight first, right? We, we've got oh, to right. Yeah, Dr. of Blight. course. Yes, yeah. Yeah, Dr. Blight gets uh, partially seduced by the lady who runs the thing for a second, and then they distract him with that and then push him into the freezer. Am I remembering this correctly? That's the yes. guy? Yeah, so, that, so that, he does end up in the freezer, but to be fair, it was either that or first being interviewed by Piers Morgan live on breakfast television. So the freezer <laughs> is the one that he chose. <laughs> I was too honorable, too honorable oh, not to work with Dr. That Edgar. did happen. Uh, just to, in case you want to wear, that's what Boris Johnson did uh, when, uh, gonna, when faced with an interview on Breakfast Television Live. He went and hid in a freezer instead. Still won the election. <laughs> yeah, 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 that happened this week. 
To be fair, oh. Jeremy Corbyn just promised to hide in the freezer, so you can't blame anyone. <laughs> if Jeremy Corbyn had promised to hide in the freezer, Labour might have won the election. <laughs> <laughs> and and just one note on this seduction thing here. It's a kid's action movie, so she can't say any seducy words, so she's just like, you know, Dr. Blight, you sure are lab you coat. Move <laughs> towards the freezer, please. <laughs> You got a nice looking T square, if you know what I mean. <laughs> I don't know what you mean. No, but yeah, he's just like slowly moving towards the freezer. And then what's his name? The kid from uh, Picket Fences uh, gets to do the trip move. So that's exciting. <laughs> this movie, it's just farts and tripping. And it's great. Yes. Like, I'm pretty sure I wrote this when I was eight, when I did a short story <laughs> for like my eighth, you know, eight year old third grade cl- writing part of the class. Like the, the movie's amazing, honestly, within that milieu like when you're eight you control not much you control farts and tripping like those are the things you can do and like you know you can't have a hammer but you can have a t-square so this is just like an eight-year-old being like yeah you know using the objects around me just like home alone yep (laughs) the thing is well again missed opportunity for a one-liner you slam the bad guy in a freezer he's just been trying to sort of come on to you you could have said time for you to cool off and then leave. No, nope, none of none of that. <laughs> no, nope. at all. They're just don't, like don't he is that. in that room now. It's in the current <laughs> room. <laughs> this guy needs to chill. Like Greta Thunberg <laughs> nailed it. <laughs> Topical. All right. So now it's time for the final confrontation between Ebner and Hulk Hogan's character. And and they have this weird moment because they realize they haven't established that Ebner knows who Hulk Hogan's character is and that they were children together. So yeah. we have that weird, like, run into someone from your hometown and they're like, Blake Torcheski? Get out of here. What are you up to? Oh, I'm, huh. you know, st- stopping you. Cool. Cool. Well, I'm... No way. I'm up to being evil still. Oh, wait, what? You're, you're being evil? Yeah. No. Uh-huh. Do you still see cool. Allison? I remember you guys are... Allison? Y- yep. Still see her? So, I'm um, I, I have to get milk back at the other side of yeah, this. Yeah, I gotta go. I'll talk to you later. I'm, cool, cool. I'll have a big messy divorce on Facebook next year if you want to no, follow good, along I'll link with that. Me in on all those messages. That's great. Do not worry. I will make sure everyone sees that. Please so, yeah. Facebook me. I'm serious. <laughs> they have, they have that that <laughs> little awkward thing, and then they uh, they they fight. They they electric rock fight. <laughs> they do. There's also a lovely little exchange as well where they sort of do the intimidating language to each other. He says, I'm going to stop you. And he says, oh, you're going to stop me? Like, yes. 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 The, the <laughs> thing that I, I just said. Yes, absolutely. That's what I said. So they fight and then <laughs> Slingshot Kid shoots Ebner and he's out of his hazmat suit. Oh, there's, there's one other tiny little line as well that I wrote down because I loved Blake, Sir Hulk Hogan says to Ebner, leave these forks alone. If you've got a problem with me, te- let's take it outside. It's like, no, you, you miss under the plot. You, you totally misunderstand the plot here, Hulk. He, <laughs> no, he didn't have a problem with things. you. He wants the crystals and the orphanage. You, like, he didn't know you were coming. You were, you were very much peripheral <laughs> oh, to this entire thing. That would have been the best if he was just like, yeah, I'll meet you outside. And Hogan walks outside and then he just takes all the crystals. <laughs> Oh, sh- oh, classic tricked again. Yeah, so they have a, a an electric crystal fight. Slingshot Kid shoots Ebner, uh, which makes his germ suit come off. So yep. he is defeated. And then they all run outside because the electric filled crystals are going to <laughs> implode the church, orphanage church. Building. Yes. Building. Yeah. And all the characters are like, hugging at this point on both teams so like yep. at some point they all like had to run out of this thing because of the crystal court the, the electricity of the courts and they all got outside and they're like all right seriously though time out on our gangs being in a fight we got to watch the sparky thing <laughs> yep seriously time out they literally take a time out and all watch and then the cops pull up and arrest the bad guys but like if if that orphanage like if anything that's that, that disturbs those crystals can set off a chain reaction that caused that orphanage to implode, in fairness, it was never safe for those kids to be living in that orphanage, and Ebby has done them a massive favor by driving <laughs> them out of that unsafe environment. Thank he you. That is, is the, he is the protagonist of this movie. It's a movie he's about shitty orphans and asshole wrestlers and people who are anti-germaphobe. It's a very good movie. 
It's important. Excellent. Absolutely. Yeah. So they have the, oh, no, what's going to happen to us now that our orphanage church imploded? And he goes, wait a second. I've got an idea. And we, we cut to like a hundred kids playing around his mansion. So, no, not his mansion. Ebner's. Ebner's mansion. It's not yeah. even his mansion. Oh, no, his I idea not. is this guy's gone to prison. <laughs> we'll steal his asshole. house and you can live there. <laughs> he, he won't volunteer his own billionaire mansion, but he'll That's volunteer amazing. Ebner's like eh, house, you know. I love this movie. <laughs> I love God, I love this yeah. movie. Yeah. Also, it's it's Ebner's house, which we're about to find out is literally n- next to a jail. So he, yeah. his plan is like, yeah, we'll put an orphanage uh, next to a jail. Next there we to go. the prison. Yeah, absolutely. And it's like, no wonder he could afford this mansion. You know, It's a big mansion, Ebner. We, we assumed he was a millionaire. Maybe he wasn't that rich. It's just he's bought a very cheap mansion because it's directly prison adjacent <laughs> yeah. at this point. But like all of these kids, there's so many more kids there. Do, so did he did he go back and get all of the other kids unadopted to come live <laughs> in this mansion? No. Or maybe a lot of parents died or something in the implosion. <laughs> like there was a backdraft thing, killed a bunch of people. No, I, th- I think it was a birthday party. They were all wearing birthday hats. I think this was a birthday party for one of the oh. three orphans. Oh. Oh. Okay, that makes sense. Solve the orphan problem for three kids is the <laughs> resolution of this movie, yeah. I'm quite certain. And the, the point as well, Clayton is riding a, a lawnmower around as well, which means that what what uh, Blake, what Hulk Hogan said was, all these kids, you can come live for free in this mansion. And Clayton, you can be the gardener there. You can work. <laughs> <laughs> you can be the you, the servant still. You can live in the servant's quarters. <laughs> You're a black guy. And the final moment of this movie is the children looking into a telescope at the villains in jail. To which little letter writing girl goes, it's a Christmas miracle. The final line of this movie is, it's a Christmas miracle as a little girl's description of imprisonment and torture of her enemies. (laughs) The end. (laughs) Yep. And we close with uh, Hulk Hogan taking his Santa hat off and being like, yay. And he throws it in the air and it lands on a a bush like a sculpted bush and then they zoom in on it and they for for like eight minutes we watch like <laughs> slow zoom in on this hat on a bush did that mean something do, nope. do you think they were like again were they setting up like a sequel like a really interesting <laughs> return of the bush bush <laughs> based what was happening i thought about this for hours i could not get this out of my head and that's the end of the movie. So you guys don't know what the Bush thing is. This is going to be okay. That's fine. Nope. That's saved for the sequel. <laughs> and that's the end of the movie. That is literally the end of the movie. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to need you guys to tell me more about this or at least give me a, a suggestion. So before we wrap it up, we're going to give Jordan Belfort and his production team some marketing advice. What's the sequel? Ideally, how do they tie in that Bush? Because I must <laughs> fucking know. Ooh, uh, the sequel is actually Jordan Belfort going to jail. That's the sequel to this movie. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think he can still stay around uh, the big holidays. What we've got is Santa, so Christmassy. You've got muscles, so uh, a physical attribute. I'm going to go uh, Easter Bunny with legs. And it's, uh, <laughs> it, it's someone who's got legs who uh, hits his head uh, on a bin and is convinced he's the Easter Bunny. And he's, he's very good at being the Easter Bunny because of his, um, his, his, le- his legs. Because the legs. Yep. Legs. Got it. Still better than this movie. All right. Well, that's going to do it for our review of Santa with muscles, soon to be Easter Bunny with legs. But that's not going to do it for the episode just yet, because we still need to get you excited about our Hanukkah-tacular. That's right. Eli, tell us what's on deck. Uh, Hallmark's, I believe, only Jewish movie... Loving Leia. Wow. <laughs> what if what if a Levitical marriage turned to love the movie? Get ready, everybody. Yeah. It what doesn't if Hallmark get less- had one Jewish friend and they wanted to prove <laughs> it? Fantastic. All right. Well, with that to look forward to, we're going to bring episode 226 to a merciful close. Huge thanks to Marsh for joining us once again. Love having you on. For anyone who's new... Where can they get some more Marsh besides God-awful movies? 
Uh, you can check out the serious grown-up work that I do for a living over at uh, goodthinkingsociety.org. God, where you hear about the skeptical movies. activism. <laughs> and uh, and uh, you can hear me on uh, the Skeptics with a K podcast, uh, which is going out every fortnight. So you can check those places out. Fantastic. <laughs> Marsh actually does really have an adult job that like matters in the world. <laughs> Fuck you. And once again, <laughs> huge thanks to all the Patreon donors for all the generosity. If you'd like to help support the show, you can make a per episode donation at patreon.com slash godawful. And then I'll get you early access to an ad free version of every episode. You can also help us out by leaving a five-star review on iTunes and by sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. And if you enjoyed the show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, The Scathing Atheist, Citation Needed, and The Skeptocrat, available on iTunes, Stitcher, and wherever else podcasts live. If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions, you can email godawfulmovies at gmail.com. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Our theme song is written and performed by Ryan Slotnick of Evil Drafts on Mars. All other music was written and performed by our audio engineer, Morgan Clark, and was used with permission. Thanks again for giving us a chunk of your life this week. For Michael Marshall and Eli Bosnick, I'm Heath Enright, promising to work hard to earn another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with the Animal House Clothes. Breakfast Club Clothes. Animal House Clothes. Ebna Frost and his henchmen were later found dead in their cell. The coroner said suicide, but the internet was unconvinced. <laughs> Eb's team didn't kill itself. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to our progressive, enlightened political landscape here in the U.S., Michael Marshall moved here. <laughs> Hulk Hogan went on to prove that he didn't know he was being filmed by saying the N-word just a bunch of times during that sex tape. <laughs> a bunch. <laughs> Did he really? Yeah. Oh, God. Wow. The fucking worst. Drill noise. No, we'll let Morgan do that. <laughs> Drill noise. Are you measuring yourself? <laughs> I am measuring myself. And saying it out loud. I am still alive. <laughs> I am alive, guys. It's what everyone does with a stethoscope. Drill two. Yeah, I had not read Interstitial One, so I, I didn't realize it was a character that <laughs> I just had to invent on the fly. I hope it was, it was great. It was a lovely, like, straight performance. It was excellent. <laughs> it, was, it was like Hopkins in Remains of the Day. There was a lot going on underneath the surface. <laughs> the preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2019. All rights reserved.